Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. Uh, this is a webinar where we get to explore Lyme disease together. Uh, we create this uh, webinar based on your questions and then as best as I can with my answers. Uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar names showing up again tonight on um, my screen, and uh, but I also see a number of new names as well, too. So for those of you that have not been here before, welcome. And I'm glad to see a lot of familiar uh, names back here again, too. So the way these webinars work, um, you create them with your questions, and you do so by writing them to me over there on that part of the screen down there. On the right-hand side, uh, you'll see a chat box. And so you write your question to me through the chat box. The thing I ask is that you only hit the Enter key one time. And the reason for that is, is if you hit it multiple times during the creation of your question, it actually sends multiple questions to me and it gets hard for me to trace it when I'm trying to post them for everybody to see. Uh, tonight during the webinar, I am creating a recording and uh, you will get a uh, email about that recording being available tomorrow somewhere around 6 to 6.30 a.m. Seattle time, which is Pacific Standard Time. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Also, if you happen to miss that email, I do post the recordings at treatlime.net on the webinars page. Um, they are also available on my uh, Facebook page, which is uh, at Facebook uh, backslash treatlime. And then you can also find them at the supplement store, Marty Ross MD Supplements on the homepage at the bottom, scroll all the way down. And that URL for the supplement store is uh, treatlime.com. And yes, the my treatlime information site is treatlime.net. A little bit of similarity there. Um, during the webinar, I'm going to go ahead and post your questions too, but I will read them. And the reason that I read them is because during the recorded version, sometimes it doesn't come out clear enough. Okay. So without any further ado, it looks like I'm not getting any comments that no one's hearing me. So I think you're all hearing me. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started here. So let's see here. All right. Hello, S. Um, let's see. Hello. Pins and needle sensation getting worse and spreading in more places in body. Does this mean the Lyme bacteria have suddenly spread all over my nerves? What do you recommend for this? Um, all right. So pins and needles is a sensation that you can get of nerves being injured. Um, uh, does it mean that Lyme suddenly spread? It's hard to say. There's nobody that's done studies to know whether that means it's spread suddenly or not. But clearly you're getting uh, more of a, ma a manifestation. A way that it's showing up is nerve irritation at this point. Okay. Um, so... It could be, I mean, one thing you ought to look at if it's if you're under treatment, for instance, and starting to happen, um, you probably need to review your medications and make sure that it's not a side effect that could be happening. Uh, so for instance, even one of the antibiotics that we use for Lyme, um, something some of us are starting to use more recently called Dapsone to treat a type of Lyme called persister Lyme. Uh, Dapsone is known for interfering with folate metabolism, the vitamin folate. And if you get uh, interference with folate, uh, sometimes you can get neuropathy from that. Uh, the antibiotic called tinidazole and metronidazole, those are two antibiotics we might use to treat the cyst form of the Lyme germ. As many of you know, Lyme exists in three forms in you. There's a spirochete form, that's thing you've seen on the internet before. There's this, a form of the Lyme that moves inside of cells called intracellular Lyme. And there's a microscopic cyst form well, some of the medicines we use to treat the cyst form, uh, which is the um, um, uh, metronidazole and tinidazole, those two uh, interfere with B6 metabolism. And so sometimes you can get neuropathy while you're on that if you're not supplementing vitamin B6. Uh, B6 you would supplement at 50 milligrams twice a day. Uh, but keep in mind, um, um, if you are getting taking B6, if you get too much, at least a neuropathy as well too. So where I would start with this is if you're developing pins and needles, you ought to bring it up with your doctor. They ought to do some basic blood testing to make sure that it's not a metabolic problem leading to this, okay? Um, and if it is uh, that you're starting to get this uh, problem, then you need to start doing some things to repair the nerves. And in addition to treating for your Lyme infection and what other co-infections might be there, all right? So things that you can do to help with nerve repair, um, number one, um, I like to make sure that people are doing things to lower inflammation caused by Lyme that can even manifest 
as neuropathy like this, okay? So the, my favorite anti-inflammatory in Lyme is something called curcumin. Uh, curcumin is a derivative or a component of turmeric, the Indian seasoning. It gets inside of white blood cells and tells them to turn down their production of inflammation chemicals made in Lyme called cytokines. And uh, if you've heard my webinars before, you'll know I talk about cytokines a lot. They, they're they what really give you most of your Lyme symptoms are cytokines. So they're good and bad. White blood cells make them when they're trying to get rid of an infection. But if they're having a hard time getting rid of an infection like Lyme, they'll make too many cytokines. And uh, too many cytokines lead to inflammation. They make it so you can't think. They give you fatigue. They make you hurt all over. They interfere with how your hormones function, et cetera. I mean, they're, they're what give you most of your Lyme symptoms are the excess cytokines, okay? So my favorite thing to lower cytokines and get that inflammation down, even of your nerves that are uh, tingling here, is curcumin, 500 milligrams three times a day. My favorite is a uh, um, something called liposome curcumin, and that can be found in a product called Mariva by Thorne. Okay, so 500 milligrams three times a day. Get your inflammation down. Second thing you want to do is help to start repairing those nerves from the inside. All right, and what is useful at doing that is a powerful antioxidant that's made in every one of our cells to repair damage, called glutathione. Glutathione also happens to be the main chemical used by the liver to detox, okay? So you get two benefits out of using uh, glutathione when you're trying to do nerve repair. Number one, you help the liver remove toxins that could be hurting your nerve function. Number two, it actually helps repair injury from the inside of the nerves or any cell for that matter, okay? So I like using a liposomal variety of glutathione too. Liposomal means it's microscopically wrapped in fat. The reason I prefer liposomal glutathione is it gets better absorbed, okay? And Research Nutritionals makes a product called Trifortify. There's a Trifortify orange, Trifortify watermelon. Both of those have good research showing that the, because they are liposomal, they actually do get increased levels within the red blood cells. Research Nutritionals has got some studies they've published about that that shows that, yeah, this stuff actually gets absorbed and gets inside of your cells, okay? So you'd want to do five milliliters, which is, I think, about 400 to 500 milligrams one time a day, all right? So the minimal things I would do for the, your, your numbness and neuropathy outside of treating your germs is get on curcumin, get on glutathione, okay? Now, if you had severe nerve injury that was beyond this numbness and tingling, I might also have you start doing things to repair the covering of your nerves, um, as well as the energy factories found in every one of our cells. The same things that repair that nerve cell membrane, which is a double layer of fat, and the mitochondria membrane, which is an energy factory found in every one of our cells, is a product called NT Factor. And um, if, uh, if you had a lot of numbness or nerve pain, I might also suggest you do the NT Factor for this kind of problem too, okay? All right, now I'm gonna show you an article you can read that it gives you even more things you can do to repair nerve dysfunction. But I think for your situation, which is just that numbness and tingling, it would be glutathione and curcumin would be enough, okay? All right, let me do a quick screen share here. Information about how to manage Lyme disease. Um, so the where you would look, uh, look in the chapter about brain and nerves. And I would take a look at the article called Neuropathy Repair, Heal That Tingling, Numbness, and Pain, okay? Where I lay out a much, much more extensively uh, what you can do about this, all right? Okay, let me go back here. All right, there we are. All right, uh, let's see if I got that whole thing answered. All right, there you go. So I, I would talk to your, your providers, see if they can do some blood testing to make sure there's not a metabolic problem. Make sure you're not taking too much B6. Look at the drugs you're taking, see if as a side effect, they might lead to neuropathy like Dapsone sometimes can and metronidazole and tinidazole can, okay? Those are some things that I would do, some basic steps, all right. Good luck to you, S. Thank you for that question.
another question here from S. Generally, I don't take more than uh, one question, but I think this will be a, a quick answer. Let's see, as far as joint pain goes, does it mean that bacteria residing at whichever joints happen to be hurting at that moment? Why does it migrate? So it's interesting about Lyme. Lyme is known for having migratory joint pains as well as migratory neuropathy, okay? Those are features that are extremely unique for Lyme. In fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Richard Horowitz, who's done, uh, developed a whole Lyme disease questionnaire, has found with some of his studies about how useful his questionnaire is, he finds that the qualities of wandering pain or wandering neuropathy are so unique for Lyme that they start being as useful at determining if you have Lyme as a, a Lyme disease blood test, okay? They can be almost as accurate as Lyme disease blood testing is at finding out if you have Lyme. That's, that's how unique they are to Lyme. Why they happen, why they migrate, who knows? We don't know. We really don't know other than it truly is a quality. I don't think it means if you start hurting at one spot that it means suddenly that there's more Lyme growth or activity there. It just is a man way that Lyme manifests for which I don't have a good explanation why that happens. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, S. Hello, Sita. Let's see. As far as joint pain goes, does it mean the bacteria residing at whichever joints happen to be hurting at the moment? Oh, I think you asked that, but you were the S. <laughs> they just asked that. I think I answered that. All right. Hello, Tom. Let's see. Dr. Ross, I've been dealing with chronic lower GI issues for almost a year now. I am Lyme positive and possibly Ehrlichia and unequivocal results for Bartonella. We have been treating for both Lyme and Candida, but what else could cause lower GI pain, burning, crampered, and discomfort? Thanks. So um, it would be useful if I knew what your age is, number one, because uh, depending on your age, we have to consider common causes that can happen to anyone, okay? So for instance, if you were in your 50s or 60s, it's time to get your screening colonoscopy done to make sure you don't have polyps or cancer sitting there, okay? And if you've got a lot of abdominal pain for which there's not a good explanation, you ought to look, um, the GI doctors may want to consider doing scoping of you to make sure you don't have something called diverticulitis, for instance, um, to look for other causes that can give you that abdominal pain that are not Lyme related, for instance. Okay, so just keep that in mind, all right? But um, in terms of Lyme and abdominal pain, number one, yeah, you can get a lot of crampy, gassy abdominal pain from yeast. But if you've done a good job treating yeast and it's still happening, then other possible causes could be parasites. Uh, sometimes you get a lot of intestinal gassiness and cramping and pain from parasites. That's uh, a possibility. Um, another thing that um, can lead to ongoing pain um, is uh, Bartonella, actually. Um, Bartonella is known for abdominal pain for which there is not other causes or are not other causes identified, all right? And what we think happens for that is uh, Bartonella is known for giving a lot of swelling of the lymph nodes throughout the body, including lymph nodes deep within the abdomen and the, the abdominal cavity. And that can present as a lot of achy pain, okay? Um, so that's a possibility. Also, Bartonella and Lyme collectively can give neuropathy and sometimes that you get nerve pain as part of that. So some things I would look for, number one is, um, Make sure that your doctors have considered common causes like um, and, and possibly getting a colonoscopy done. Make sure you don't have uh, anything uh, uh, in terms of uh, polyps or cancer uh, causes of that as well. OK, number two, um, consider with that Bartonella, whether you might have Bartonella giving your abdominal pain. All right, so in terms of Bartonella, how do you know if you have Bartonella? Well, testing isn't perfect, all right? So, and the reason is we estimate that there are 15, I'm sorry, 30 strains, around 30 strains of Bartonella, of which we can test for two human strains, but we think some of the animal strains also infect people as well too. And we don't have decent testing for those. So symptoms that make me think about Bartonella could be pain on the balls of the feet, a lot of ongoing anxiety, um, uh, sometimes depression can fit with that too. Um, uh, having um, a lot of a bladder irritation sometimes. You can get inflammation of the lining of the bladder called interstitial cystitis, which can give you uh, problems with um, burning on urination, urge to pee frequently, for instance. Um, 
Um, also, people sometimes will get restless legs. Uh, sometimes they'll have a um, um, feeling of air hunger, like you can't get enough air from time to time. From time to time. You can get a lot of neurologic hypersensitivities with a Bartonella. Uh, sometimes you can get a testicular pain um, uh, with Bartonella. You can get a lot of shin pain, bone pain sometimes, um, tremors, uh, seizures, uh, severe cognitive impairment. Those are things that make you wonder about Bartonella. Now, you don't have to have all of them, but if you have a lot of those, you got to start thinking about treating for Bartonella and the abdominal pain as well too. Okay. All right. Uh, good. I, Tom, I hope that gives you some thoughts on that. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Christine. Thank you for the webinar. You're welcome. How long is the treatment for mold toxicity taking cholesteramine? I've been taking one half teaspoon daily for three months and I'm beginning to feel better, Christine. All right. So it depends on how, how long you treat, depends on how aggressively you're treating. Okay. So, um, when, so cholesteramine, everyone, is a uh, anti-cholesterol medicine that binds cholesterol, which is a fat, okay? Mold toxins, when they get trapped in us, are a fat too. And so what happens when people have mold toxin illness, according to the work of a physician named Richie Shoemaker, about 25% of all people, whether they have Lyme or don't have Lyme, have difficulty removing mold toxins once they get breathed in or eaten in to them, okay? And what happens in 75% of people is that those mold toxins get tagged, um, are recognized by the immune system and they're tagged. And once they're tagged, they get broken down and get removed from the body. But if they're not tagged correctly, they go to the liver as a fat-based toxin. The liver is supposed to take fat-based toxins and transform them into water-based toxins. But in the case of these mold toxins, it can't do it. So those mold toxins go to the liver, they get processed still as fat-based toxins, they go out into the intestines and they get reabsorbed again. All right. So you have this swimming pool of toxins that just keep recirculating if you happen to be one of those 25%. Now what those toxins do, just like Lyme, they trigger too many cytokines, okay? In fact, mold toxicity illness can look just like Lyme disease does, which uh, brings me to a point of mine, which is, if you got a Lyme test that's positive and you got sick initially when you lived in a home full of mold, it might be that your only problem actually is mold toxicity illness that's triggering all your cytokines and not Lyme, all right? So sometimes, what I usually recommend, I've got a patient that it's from the history, it looks like they were living in that house full of a lot of black mold when they started coming down with all their symptoms that look like Lyme disease. If I do urine testing on them using a lab called Real-Time Labs that shows that they have a lot of mold toxins, I'm usually going to treat for their mold toxicity first because getting those mold toxins out may be enough to remove all of their symptoms and then we don't even have to worry about treating that positive Lyme test, okay? Yeah, that's true. You don't necessarily always have to treat your Lyme test. If your symptoms go away by removing mold toxins, you don't necessarily need to treat the Lyme, okay? Um, anyhow, back to your question. So what Shoemaker has shown is that if you use cholesteramine, it will grab hold of those fat-based toxins that get out into the intestines so that they cannot get reabsorbed again. And a very aggressive way of doing it would be to actually do one whole scoop. The, the, the cholesteramine comes with a scoop. One whole scoop three or four times a day. All right. So how you're doing, which is half a teaspoon, is, is really kind of a slow way of doing, which is fine. It's just going to take you longer. But if you are able to get up to three scoops, um, uh, one scoop three times a day, often doing that for two months is going to remove all those mold toxins. Now, the issue, if you go that aggressive, is a timing issue, and you could really trigger a big flare-up, too, so you have to be careful, all right? From a timing standpoint, it's hard to do because cholesteramine binds other things. So when we use cholesteramine, you have to stop taking medicines and supplements a half hour before you take cholesteramine, and you can't start taking any of those medicines and supplements till two hours after you take the cholesteramine, okay? So that makes it hard to take cholesteramine three times a day. Now, keep in mind, the pharmacist is going to tell you not to have anything two hours before through two hours after. Some pharmacists will even try to tell you don't have anything four hours before your cholesteramine through four hours after your cholesteramine, which is ridiculous. It's impossible to do cholesteramine that way. 
You can do it, use cholesteramine safely though, by just not having any of those medicines and supplements 30 minutes before you start the cholesteramine through two hours after you take it. And also you can eat any time, although the ideal time would be half an hour after you take cholesteramine is the ideal time to eat, okay? All right, but anyhow, to answer your question, if you could get up to doing this three times a day, one whole scoop three times a day, two months, you're probably done. At the rate that you're doing it, um, it may take six months or more. Um, that would be what my experience is, okay? Now, you got to be careful if you try to get more aggressive. When you start pulling those toxins out, it can trigger a huge cytokine surge, right? And I was talking about cytokines all right tonight. And you can get really sick. You can get knocked down pretty badly. So you've got to got to go, depending on the person, there's some people that can jump right away up to one scoop three times a day. And there's some people that you just got to go minuscule amounts to be able to get to where you're going, okay? Also, regarding mold toxicity issues, um, for those of you who don't have access to cholesteramine, depending on which mold toxins come out of you when you look on a test, there may be different binders you can use. So some might do better using activated charcoal, and there's some that might do better using betonite clay, for instance, okay? All right, so for more information about which toxin, how do you figure out if you have too many toxins and um, mold toxins, that is, and what is the best binder? Uh, what I would do is take a look at the article that I've written about that. Yeah, let's go back over. And there is an article in here called Mold and Lyme Toxin Illness, okay? So take a look at that, all right? Okay, so um, let me just, I'm going to just show you all one thing here. Um, so I just uh, have spent the last week or so rewriting the Lyme disease treatment protocol I have called the, the Ross Lyme Support Protocol, okay? And y'all may want to take a look at this. I'm trying to get to a document together. You'll be able to print this off as well too. But while I'm trying to get that printable document together for you, I have published the new one. And I want to just say it's, it's quite a rewrite from the previous one, although you will see a lot of commonality here. But one thing I'm going to point out is a new point that I raised. Before you start doing anything, here's my point I was just making with you. Before you start treating your Lyme, I say treat your mold toxin illness first if you got sick when you were living in a place that had obvious mold exposures, okay? That's even what I'm saying to do in my, my treatment protocol now. I've learned this the hard way and some good ways um, that this is the best way to go is to try to deal with that first, okay? All right. Let me go back here. All right. Um, let's see. Here we are. All right. There we are. All right, Christine. Good luck to you. I, hope, I know that's a very long winded response, but I just wanted to give you a range of ideas there, too. Okay. All right. Hello, Jenny. Let's see. After months of treating Bart and Lyme, a new symptom has popped up, vertigo. I've never experienced it before, but now when it hits, I can't see straight. This room spins so bad. Is this a Lyme or Bart symptom, or could it be a symptom of a different co-infection? Um, so it could have nothing to do with Lyme and Bart. I'll just start by saying that, okay? So the one thing we have to be careful of whenever symptoms happen is to not always think that they are Lyme and Bartonella when we have Lyme and Bartonella, okay? So there is a condition which is known as benign positional vertigo, which is a problem that is not caused by Lyme that develops of the inner, uh, the balance apparatus of the inner ear. And so one thing, especially if this is coming on intermittently that you may want to have done would be to have an ear, nose and throat doctor take a look at you to see whether this is one of those inner ear problems. And if so, there's actually a maneuver called the Epley maneuver where they can do some physical therapy movements of your head to reposition um, stones that are involved in this uh, balance apparatus of the inner ear to get that to go away, okay? So that's one thing I would say, okay? The second thing I wanna let you know is that the co-infection Babesia, sometimes as part of it, has imbalance that can develop. And so you might wanna consider 
Uh, think about, look at the symptoms that are associated with Bambesia. And if you have a number of those symptoms, it might be that this is a missed Bambesia problem as well too, okay? All right, so how do you figure out if you have Bambesia? Uh, let me show you how to do that. Go back over here to the Treat Line book. Chapter called How to Diagnose. And there's a whole article that I have on, is it Bambesia? All right, so it's called How to Diagnose Bambesia. Take a look at this article to give you some good details about what to do, okay? All right, let me go back here. Hello, Tina. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Which supplements would you suggest I could be taking to support weekly methotrexate injections prescribed by my doctor? I've been using it for five months now for rheumatoid arthritis, although the rheumatoid arthritis factor is negative. I've been treating Lyme under your care for about five years and feel something and feel... Tina, guess what? Um, I don't think the rest of your question. Oh, here. And feel it is rather Lyme arthritis. I'm also struggling with memory and cognitive issues. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, Tina, um, it's hard for me. So, okay. So, sometimes um, the thing about arthritis of the joints and rheumatologist. Rheumatologists like to put people in defined boxes that they have. There's this one box that if you have certain symptoms, they call that lupus. And there's this other box that if you have certain symptoms, they call that rheumatoid arthritis, okay? However, most rheumatologists refuse to still accept that it's Lyme that can look like what they call rheumatoid arthritis and Lyme that can look like what they call lupus, for instance, okay? So if you have Lyme and you don't have the positive testing for rheumatoid arthritis, it may very, and even if you did have the testing for rheumatoid arthritis, it may very well be that what you've got is Lyme arthritis, all right? All right, now methotrexate is a, a chemotherapy drug that suppresses the immune system. And I'm not always necessarily a big fan of, it, of using it unless Everything else that we're doing for Lyme is not getting your inflammation under control. And it's kind of one of those things that you just have to do, okay? All right, now th there's enough going on here and, and stuff I can't disclose. You did tell everyone that you're my patient, but, um, or that you've been my patient. Um, what I would say is it may be time, because it's, it's been a while, <laughs> that given what's going on with you, for me to give you the best advice that we actually set up a time to have a visit again, okay? I'm doing one of my one-to-one -one consults um, because um, joint pain sometimes is not always inflammatory. Sometimes what I find, for instance, in Lyme, that this joint pain that remains even after you've treated Lyme or been treating Lyme for a while may in fact be due to cartilage injury caused by Lyme breaking the cartilage down and sometimes one of the things you can do is be on glucosamine sulfate, which is one of the building blocks for cartilage. Uh, 500 milligrams uh, three times a day. Do that for about three months. Sometimes that can take care of the remaining joint pain. Another thing you can do is if it really is an autoimmune illness where the, your immune system is attacking your joints, giving a picture that looks like rheumatoid arthritis, one of the drugs that you could take um, that is a approach that the rheumatologists are just are not familiar with that modulates the immune system is to do something called low-dose naltrexone. Um, naltrexone is a um, narcotic blocker. We, we tend to use it for people that have uh, drug overdoses uh, of narcotics, all right? And what it does, it blocks in, uh, narcotic receptors. Well, our bodies, we make a natural, we have a natural narcotic system called endorphins. And our bodies manufacture endorphins for a number of reasons. One is to regulate pain. But the other thing that the endorphins do is they regulate the immune system and they regulate it in a way to turn it off so it doesn't attack you, okay? So um, one of the things we could do is use naltrexone at a lower dose that's manufactured. It's actually manufactured as a 50 milligram pill, 
but we can have it manufactured uh, by a compounding pharmacist. So it's a 1.5, a three milligram or 4.5 milligram pill. And at a low dose, what happens is that naltrexone binds our endorphin receptors. Brain doesn't like that. Brain likes to maintain balance. And so what it does is it sends out a bunch of signals to the endorphin producing cells in the bodies and says, make more endorphins, and they do. So what happens is as that naltrexone wears off, those receptors get bombarded with all these extra um, endorphins, okay? And that can have an effect of turning down autoimmune illness, of decreasing an autoimmune attacking of your body. So there's three medical conditions for which we have some limited science that says this works. One of those is Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory arthritis condition of the intestines, fibromyalgia, and in multiple sclerosis, some types of multiple sclerosis it can help for, okay? No one's done um, research um, in rheumatoid arthritis. I haven't seen any studies about that. But I will tell you, when somebody has autoimmune illness, this is something I will do before I have people resort to a methotrexate, okay? And that might be something for you to consider. So two things is, is there joint damage, which glucosamine can help? Second would be, look at information I have on my website about low-dose naltrexone. And because it's just been a long time since you and I have talked, um, uh, like a long time, I would suggest that um, um, that you might even consider doing another consult with me again as well too, okay? All right, um, let me just show, do a quick screen share here about show you one thing. So um, back in the treat line book, uh, in terms of, um, you'll look under the immune system chapter and in here is an article, there should be an article about low-dose naltrexone. There it is. Take a look at this article. Actually, you can look at two articles. You can either look at this one called When Your Immune System Causes Lyme or the article called On Low-Dose Naltrexone. They both have a lot to do with low-dose naltrexone, okay? And that'll give you more of the information about why this might help you and you could use it as an alternative to doing the methotrexate, all right? All right, let me go back here. Hello, Rose. Let's see, what are the two most important supplements to take for adrenal and thyroid if a person has Lyme? Two things. Number one, if you think you have low adrenals or low thyroid, um, that's being triggered often by the excess cytokines, okay? So you, uh, and the reason for that is the cytokines interfere with the brain's ability to communicate properly with the thyroid and adrenal or to interpret correctly what's happening with the thyroid and adrenal glands. And so therefore the brain, which is supposed to be releasing chemicals that direct the thyroid and the adrenals to work correctly, may not do it because the cytokines are messing up its ability to do that, okay? So number one, lower cytokines. And to do that, I would use the Mariva um, uh, 500, which is curcumin, uh, 500 milligrams uh, three times a day. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, I would get started on ashwagandha. Um, ashwagandha is an Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine herb that has been used for thousands of years in those cultures to give people energy that are under stress, okay? It's also known as an adaptogen. And if we look at um, animal studies, we don't have good human studies, but if we look at animal studies, it appears by the animal studies that um, when, when um, animals are on ashwagandha, there's better functioning of the adrenals as well as the thyroid. And that may be why the Chinese and, uh, and, and in Ayurvedic medicine, the Indians actually observe that um, people have better energy being on this is that it, it, it actually helps both the adrenal and the thyroid, all right? So it's a 400 milligram pill. And the way that you would wind up using it is as uh, two pills in the morning and two pills between one and two. That's generally the way I recommend it. I don't have people take it later than one to two. Uh, the reason for that is, is it can actually be too stimulating and keep you awake, all right? So you don't wanna do that, all right? Uh, but those would be some things to think about. The other thing that you might wanna take a look at, um, and I'm just gonna show you in the, the treatment protocol. So again, as, as I said, everyone,
before. Uh, but in the thyroid section, uh, the hormone section of my treatment protocol, I'm just trying to scroll down to get to it here. Again, so I, I've talked about sleep and then I've changed one of my sleep recommendations to a medication called trazodone. Um, that's interesting. Some of my formatting is kind of turned out odd here, but we'll fix that. Um, let's see here. All right, so in the hormone section, uh, I talk about for thyroid using the ashwagandha, but then also there's some micronutrients that help. One of those is zinc, being on selenium, and being on iodine, okay? Those can make a useful difference. And you don't, you don't necessarily have to supplement these individually. You can get these as part of a multivitamin, like uh, the Physician's Daily Multivitamin has these in it, or the um, Integrative Therapeutics has a multivitamin called the Energy Revitalization System. So you want to make sure you're, you're um, using a um, good multivitamin that has those essential nutrients in it too, okay? Questions. You've got two places to look. See if I addressed it in the, um, in the treatment protocol, all right? Second is I've got all those articles that you can read too um, that are useful as well too within TreatLine, okay? All right. Thanks for the question, Rose. Hello, Kim, we'll see. Hi, Dr. Ross. My daughter tested positive for Marcon's and Dr. Susek's mold exposure. Having the house tested with ERMI, is this the best test? Also, what might recovery look like? How long? Any advice? Do patients have to get rid of all their belongings if the house has mold? Help. Okay, so, so first of all, um, trying to figure out where to jump in here. So Dr. Richie Shoemaker, I mentioned him earlier, um, has developed a whole elaborate, he's kind of the, um, uh, the grandfather, the, the leader of the idea of mold toxicity illness. He's the first one that um, helped many of us to focus on that as a potential problem. He developed some of the initial science. There's some things he got that I think are right. And as I've worked with his theories over time, there's some things that are wrong. Um, and even, even though he's still working with it, I, I don't, uh, fully support some aspects of his theory, okay? So in his theory, what he said is that there are 25% of people that are genetically predisposed uh, towards not being able to remove mold toxins. And he's gone on to develop an elaborate science for something called chronic inflammatory response syndrome, all right? And the first thing he thinks that people need to consider is if they're all inflamed is, do they have mold toxins? And, and under his theory, you would the way you would look to see if you have mold toxicity illness is you would look and see if you have the genetic predisposition to be one of those people that has the problem. And if you do, then the next step would be to go ahead and bind up all those mold toxins, okay? All right. The second step is if you've removed, after you've removed all the mold toxins, if you are not better, then the, so then the second step is only after you cleared your mold toxins is to look and see, do you have an infection growing in your nose called Marcon's? And Marcon stands for methicillin resistant coagulase negative staph, okay? Which all together says Marcon's. That's how we came up with the word Marcon's, all right? And so what he believes is that this is a bacteria that if it's living in your nose, hiding under biofilms, and you don't get better after you remove your mold toxins, that is these things here that may be inflaming your immune system to keep making cytokines that make you sick, all right? And so his theory says you treat for it, all right? But here's what I know, and here's probably what most people that treat Marcon's know, even the doctors that have trained with him, is you can't get rid of the stuff. It keeps coming back again and again and again. It is a rare person that if you treat Marcon's that you can actually get rid of it. Even Shoemaker would admit that too, actually, all right? So I've stopped trying to get rid of it. I, I just think it's impossible to get rid of. And I don't actually, the more I've worked with his theories, I don't think it's a problem. Just because you see something growing here does not mean it is triggering all that inflammation, right? Because even when I've had periods of time where I've gotten it knocked down, people still stay inflamed. There's other stuff that's leading to that inflammation. So 
in terms of your mark-ons, I wouldn't do anything about it. I don't think it's the problem. And just because you tested for mark-ons, does it mean you have mold? No. The only issue with mold is that in Richie Shoemaker's theory, it was the second, mark-ons is the second thing you're supposed to try to correct if you don't get better removing mold. But having mark-ons does not mean you have mold, <laughs> okay? All right, now, in terms of if your doctors have done the testing that Shoemaker advises to look to see if you have the genetic predisposition, that testing is not always correct. You can have the genetic predisposition and getting mold toxins out may not even help you. Or you may not have the genetic predisposition, but for some other reason, you may have mold toxins trapped in you, okay? So I don't do that test anymore either. What I have now do is a urine test using a company called Realtime Labs that measures for four different kinds of families of mold toxins in you to see, are they really trapped in you, all right? That's where I start next, okay? All right, now, if I get somebody back that has a urine test that says, yeah, they got mold toxins in them, then yes, I do look to see, is it in the house or the work environment? In other words, are you currently being exposed, okay? Now, if you do all your ERMI testing and you don't find you have an exposure source at work or home, it may mean that these mold toxins got trapped in you years ago, or you've had multiple small exposures that have built up over time from outside, okay? Now, is an ERMI a good way to see if you have mold in your environment and mold toxins in your environment? Yes, I think it can be an accurate test. And it's a test you can do on your own. You would go to a company's website called Mycometrics. That's M-Y-C-O-M-E-T-R-I-X. You would order up the ERMI test kit, okay? Uh, that's one way to do it. The other thing you can do is invite a professional service into your home to do the molding inspection for you, okay? Um, there are companies that actually do that quite well. So for instance, a company I like using here in Seattle is a company called Kester Clear that does a great job because they actually help you identify where it is and help you figure out how to remediate your house. And they would be the company that could tell you, do you need to remove your furniture or not, okay? So uh, you might try to get a professional help from a company that does mold remediation. But I would make sure before you start going down that whole pathway, make sure your daughter really has the problem. I would get a real-time test. Not, don't rely on the genetic test that Shoemaker advises, and I know a lot of my colleagues do, but actually get the mold test through real-time labs and see, are you pouring out extra mold toxins? Okay, that's where I would start. And I don't believe in treating Marcons anymore. I don't think it makes a difference. I think it's an interesting theory that Dr. Shoemaker had, but I just don't find it helpful in terms of helping people. And I find that it just cannot be eradicated that easily. Okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Kim. And thank you for that question. Hello, Michelle. See, I have Hashimoto's and adrenal fatigue. Is this caused from Lyme? What is the best thing to do for both of these issues? Okay. So Michelle, um, kind of, I started talking about part of that earlier tonight. So Hashimoto, or I was talking about the things to take for your adrenals and thyroid, well, and I'll come back to those in a minute here. So Hashimoto's, everyone, is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune condition where your immune system starts attacking the thyroid gland. And you will develop antibodies against thyroid tissue, okay? The way to see if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis is to get an antibody test. You can do antibodies for something called TPO antibodies and also something called antithyroglobulin antibodies, all right? If you don't have elevation of those antibodies, you don't have Hashimoto's, all right? Now, the thing that's significant about Hashimoto's thyroiditis is if you do have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, not only do you often get or will you get low thyroid uh, or hypothyroidism, um, also, there, because this is an autoimmune condition, it may mean that the, your um, immune system isn't just attacking the thyroid. It may be attacking your body, which is why you ache and why you have low fatigue separate from having Lyme, okay? All right. But if you have Lyme, very often it is the Lyme that has triggered the immune system to start attacking your thyroid, all right? So... When somebody's got Hashimoto's thyroiditis, what I like to do, is, and this has been shown to be helpful, is number one, replace the thyroid, okay? Be on a thyroid medication, uh, like an Armour thyroid or a levothyroxine or a Cytomel, all right? Number two, it is shown in natural medicine literature, not in conventional medicine literature, but in natural medicine studies, that being on zinc 
25 to 50 milligrams, selenium 100 to 200 micrograms, and also being on, um, <laughs> just blank, we'll go look there in a minute. The nutrients I just showed you a minute ago, um, being on those three nutrients can help um, your um, uh, thyroid gland work better, okay? Then the third thing I like to get people on when they have autoimmune conditions of any kind, including the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, is to be on low dose naltrexone. And I talked about that earlier tonight too. Those are some things you would wanna do. The other thing you can do to help get your thyroid and adrenal supported is ashwagandha, all right? All right now, I've written some extensive articles about thyroid that gives you a bigger explanation, much bigger than what I just did here. The nutrients are zinc, selenium, and iodine. I'm sorry, you would want to get on iodine. Now, keep in mind, you don't want to go too high in your iodine. You don't want to go over 500 micrograms a day because that can suppress the thyroid, okay? All right, all right. But in terms of an article that I've written that has a lot of information about thyroid, take a look at the um, hormone chapter. And you want to take a look at my article called Hypothyroidism, the best test meds and vitamins. And within here, I talk extensively about what to do for Hashimoto's thyroiditis, okay? All right, all right. Well, one other thing about testing too is that um, hypothyroidism, you can have normal tests and yet still have tons of symptoms of low thyroid like uh, low thyroid symptoms would be things like fatigue, muscle achiness, uh, hair falling out, dry skin, change in your periods, cold intolerance, meaning you're the person who has to wear a lot more layers than everyone around you to stay comfortable. Okay, that's cold intolerance. Um, so anyhow, those are symptoms of low thyroid. The problem is in Lyme disease, often the blood tests don't reflect what is happening out in the tissues with the thyroid, all right? And I explain a lot more about that in that article. But sometimes in Lyme, you just give thyroid based on what the symptoms are, okay? And I explain, again, read more about the article about that, all right? Um, which gives a sound explanation for why you would wind up doing that, okay? All right. Good luck to you, Michelle. Hello, Val. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Could you comment on the various types of parasitic helminths that can be tra transmitted by ticks or that are associated with chronic Lyme disease? Really appreciate all you do to help the Lyme community. So, uh, Val, I'm not, at this point, I know that, that uh, especially one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt out here, has been become a big proponent of the idea that it's, um, uh, that parasites, um, in ticks or parasites in general in the body are the main reason why people aren't getting well. And actually, I'm not a big believer in the theory. I'm not a good person to talk about this. I think it's um, been overly hyped up actually. Um, and at this point, I am not treating for parasites. I'm just, um, as I've looked at the information about it, I, I'm just not a big proponent of the idea. I think Dietrich Klinghardt out here, many of you may know, um, is a brilliant Lyme doctor, but I think he's crazy brilliant. I think there's some ideas he has that are really good, he pushes the envelope of thinking, and I've learned a great deal and tried things of his. And there's some things I think he is just way off base. And this is one of those ideas that actually we've looked at with a number of my colleagues too. And I just think he's off base on this one. Now that may change in time if I start seeing some more science about it, but I, I guess I don't have any more information for you than that. Okay, all right. Thanks for that uh, question, Val. Hello, Katrina. Let's see, what is your take on root canals in Lyme? Um, so one of, the, one of the problems that can happen with root canals is so when you get a root canal, um, it may uh, result in having little pockets where Lyme can live, okay? And so you get these areas that chronic Lyme infection can remain. So generally, I'm not a big proponent of getting them, um, or if you have root canals and you're not getting better, you may want to see a biologic dentist or somebody that can do x-rays to see if you happen to have these pockets of infections underneath your teeth, okay? That's my take on it. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Katrina.
Hello, Craig. Let's see. Hi, Marty. Please comment on results. Let's see. On results, RNA TX for Lyme. And are biofeedback studies valid? So, Craig, I'm not quite sure what you mean by please comment on results, RNA treatment or test. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not clear what your question is about the first part there. Biofeedback, which is, um, there's various ways of, um, hmm. and I think by biofeedback, you, I think you're probably meaning kinesiology type testing where people do muscle testing or a, the, a way that uh, Dietrich Klinghardt out here has proposed uh, an energetic testing method called autonomic response testing. I think those forms of testing are only as good as the tester. I think there's some people that do it well. I think Dietrich Klinghardt does it well. Some of the people he's trained, I think do it well. A lot of the people he's trained, I don't think do it well. I've had to deal with a lot of the patients that have come to me after they've seen those other providers too. So that kind of testing is not always valid because it's only as good as the person doing the testing. It's a, it's a very much um, a, very, a, a very specialized technique, okay? Right. And I'm sorry, I'm just not clear what your first part of your question means there. All right. Good luck to you, Craig. Oh, here it is. Okay. Results are in a treatment. I, I know what you're talking about now. Um, I haven't seen good benefit from it. Um, that's what I would say. All right. I just have not seen good benefit from it. All right. Thanks, Craig. Let's see. Got some questions that got asked twice here that I'm just trying to clear out here, everyone. All right. Hello, Joel. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Which neurologic diseases, autoimmune diseases, is Lyme or the co infection known to cause? Could one have ALS, MS, Parkinson's, and also have Lyme? Which neurologic tests are most useful for helping direct Lyme treatment? EEG, EMG, specs, brain, cervical MRI, etc. All right, good question. Um, all right, so um, turn, so so Lyme can trigger autoimmune illnesses. Okay, that means it could trigger lupus, it could trigger scleroderma, it could trigger lupus. Um, the whole, all anything that's autoimmune, Lyme could potentially trigger. Okay. Now you get into a semantics issue then is does somebody have Lyme only or do they have Lyme and lupus? And then you also, it's possible that somebody has Lyme and they have lupus or an autoimmune illness that is triggered separately. It has nothing to do with their Lyme and there's no way of distinguishing it. Okay. What I do find often with the autoimmune illnesses though, is if you treat Lyme and don't do anything to address those autoimmune illnesses specifically, like being on methotrexate or being on anything else, people are going to get better. So I know that Lyme can be a big factor in some of those autoimmune illnesses. All right. Now, so in terms of um, uh, ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, everyone, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, um, and those neurologic conditions, some people that have those conditions, it is caused by Lyme. All right. Uh, not everyone with those conditions, but some people who have those conditions, one cause of those conditions is Lyme. Um, and then again, you get into a semantics issue. So if you've got somebody that has MS and they test positive for Lyme, do you call it Lyme? Do you call it MS Lyme? Or do you call it MS and Lyme? Could they have two individual conditions, Lyme? And then could they have MS that was triggered by something else besides Lyme? Yeah, it's possible but you treat the Lyme and you see, does any progress happen in the condition basically, okay? And then what neurologic tests are helpful for, uh, for helping direct Lyme treatment? So EEGs, I just don't find to be that useful. The, even you can have, for instance, seizure disorder um, in Lyme disease and often it never shows up on the EEG, okay? They're, they're non, what we call non-elliptiform seizures, basically, all right? So I don't find them that helpful. 
EMGs are useful and nerve conduction studies are type of studies where they put needles in your muscles or along the nerve pathways to see if there is nerve injury. Um, but, and that, but that kind of nerve injury is only useful for determining large nerve injury, not small nerves, all right? And small nerve fibers. And most of the time in Lyme, it's small nerve fiber injury you have. So generally, I don't find it useful to do nerve conduction or EMG studies either, okay? In terms of getting MRIs of the brain and the cervix, there is one kind of situation where it can be useful, and that is that you can actually see architecturally, are there lesions created from Lyme? Are there Lyme lesions? And it gives you a way to follow, especially if you're treating somebody, um, to see, do those lesions go away? Okay, so sometimes that can be useful. Um, the spec scan is a type of x-ray where we get to see uh, what's happening with the blood flow to the various areas of the brain. And uh, spec scanning um, is useful at trying to determine, do you have in brain involvement? It actually can measure it in a way that, um, so you can have Lyme involvement of the brain and not have lesions seen on the MRI. An MRI is basically an architectural study. It looks at the architecture. The SPECT, on the other hand, gives you a functional look at the brain, and then it determines, uh, based on blood flow, what areas of the brain might not be functioning correctly, okay? And yes, that can be useful as well, too. So out of those, the studies I might find useful, SPECT and, and brain MRI, that uh, and cervical MRI. The other tests, I just don't find that useful, actually. All right. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Joel. Good luck to you. Hello, Joyce. Let's see. I'm wondering if chronic long-term Lyme leads to disorders such as Parkinson's, MS, ALS, rheumatoid arthritis. Do you know what percentage of Lyme patients is going to develop these? So in part, I just answered part of that question, okay? In terms of what percent of people with Lyme develop those disorders, we have no idea. There are no studies done about that, okay? And it actually fits into another situation where uh, I often will get asked when I'm stop um, um, uh, when I stop somebody's Lyme treatment, what are their chances that they're going to develop one of these problems? Because as you know, as many of you may know, um, when we treat chronic Lyme and we get somebody well from it, the germ probably still is living in them. All right, we're not able to get rid of this germ in most people that have had it for a year or more. That's my belief. That's the belief of many of us that treat chronic Lyme disease as well too. Okay. So the question is, since that thing is still living in you, is it gonna cause problems down the road? We know that a lot of people can go through Lyme relapses when they have that germ living in them, but the thing about Lyme relapse, often if you catch it early and you get back into treatment, it's usually about four months or so, you're back on your way again, you're back to a good place again, okay? But, for, but um, other than that, yeah, it might be sitting back there leading to problems like dementia, maybe Parkinson's, maybe uh, lupus, maybe RA. But we have no studies done that tell us any idea what happens to people long term that have this germ chronically living in them. Okay, And part of the reason we don't have those kind of studies is that the infectious disease doctor community and most of the medical community still doesn't believe that Lyme exists and lives on. They think that when we have these studies that show that the DNA of the Lyme germ is still in, a, in, in us, or in animals that we study, that it must be some debris left behind that for some reason the immune system can't get rid of. And so therefore they still hold, they come up with all these reasons where they try to deny that Lyme still is living in a person. They come up with all these other explanations like the germs that we're measuring are dead, but they just haven't been cleared. Or the DNA of the germ just happens to be stuck in there, but the immune system never got around to clearing it out. So those things that we measure that suggest that Lyme lives on chronically, they have explanations to explain that it's not real. Most of us know we think it's real, those of us that treat chronic Lyme. So if they don't think it lives on long enough, we can't get people to fund research looking at the long-term things that develop in somebody that has chronic Lyme disease. So I, I honestly just don't know, okay? All right. Thanks for that uh, question, Joyce. Hello, Diane. Let's see, is a spinal tap a good way to find Lyme in the spinal fluid? Thank you. Uh, probably not. Um, if we look at studies about um, Lyme and then doing a spinal tap to look at the spinal fluid, 
when somebody has a case of Lyme, um, generally it will only show up uh, or show up as a positive test in the spinal fluid 50% of the time. All right. They can have obvious neuro, central neurologic and spinal cord symptoms and have positive Lyme testing out in the blood, but it will not come back in the spinal cord. 50% of the time it won't. Okay. So it's, it's not that useful of a test actually. All right. Thanks for that question. Hello, Amanda. Say hi, Dr. Ross. Thank you for doing these. Can you speak to cranial nerve involvement and Lyme and neuroborrelia, especially cranial nerve um, 11? Thanks. So the cranial nerves, everybody, are a bunch of nerves that come off of what's called the, the bottom of the brain or the brainstem area back here on the back, okay? And we number them, and there's 12 of them. So for instance, there's three different ones that control whether your eyes move up or down or sideways. There's a couple that control, there's one that controls how your tongue moves. There's some two, I think that control how you swallow. Um, and uh, there's one called the vagal nerve that controls whether your heart races or skips or whether you have low blood pressure or not. That's the nerve that can sometimes be infected when people have POTS, uh, which is the um, postural hypotension uh, syndrome that uh, some orthostatic, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome that sometimes, <laughs> excuse me, sometimes people with Lyme develop too. But that's probably caused by infection of the vagal nerve that is supposed to control your heart rate and control all those things. So can Lyme infect individual um, cranial nerves? The answer is yes. Um, and the treatment is treat your Lyme, okay? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean because they're cranial nerves that you have to do IV antibiotics. You can get at the infections by using oral antibiotics, okay? So yes, it can infect any one of the cranial nerves. All right, good luck to you, Amanda. Hold on here a minute, everyone. <coughs> Ah, Michelle, we answered that one already. All right. Hello, Laura. Let's see. Have you treated people with multiple autoimmune diseases and co-infections along with Lyme? A more complex case. For instance, I have endometriosis, uh, herpes virus 6, I think you mean, Epstein-Barr, prior, uh, prior military have had anthrax vaccination. Um, so have I treated people that have multiple autoimmune and co-infections? Yes, I have. Um, uh, Lyme is uh, probably one of the trickiest, most systemic illnesses. It involves every organ. Um, it comes in with multiple problems. So to answer your question, yeah, I have. Um, in terms of endometriosis, I would just point out one thing that's interesting about that. So there's a, um, a gynecologist uh, named Andrew Cook uh, down in Los Gatos, California who has a practice that has been focused on treating women with chronic pelvic pain. So he tends to attract a lot of patients that come to see him have endometriosis as the cause of their chronic pelvic pain. And a number of years ago, he actually did studies where he, um, the way that he treats endometriosis is he actually excises, cuts out the endometrius, those endometrial lesions that occur in endometriosis. So endometriosis, everyone, is a condition where you develop tissue that looks like the inside of the uterus grows on the outside of the uterus and sometimes within the pelvic region, sometimes even gets up into the abdomen and it can hurt. It can lead to a lot of bleeding problems, uh, uh, vaginal and uterine bleeding problems. Um, but what he found, he would, he would excise them. He would cut them. Most doctors actually um, burn them or cauterize them to remove them during surgery, but he would excise them and he sent them off to the lab to see what they are. And uh, evidently about, I think it was around 80% of them grew out as Lyme, all right? So some of that endometriosis is actually a direct effect of Lyme infection. It's not autoimmune actually, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Laura. Hello, Diane. Let's see, can infection from a neglected tooth, infected tooth, get into the brain? 
I, I mean, in theory, it's possible like the, where it would go. Some of the um, actually, as I'm thinking about, not directly, they would have to go up into the sinuses, and then that might work its way up into the brain. More likely, you could get into a sinus infection, but not directly into the brain. Okay. Hello, Misty. Hello. Thank you for doing these webinars. This is my second one to attend. I love learning. <laughs> Thank you, Misty. I appreciate you saying that. And welcome back again. And thanks for sitting through my long explanations, too. I hope when they're long, they all get something out of it, though. But um, I assume you must, because the numbers of people coming to these are growing, actually, on a pretty regular basis. And I see a lot of people coming back. I, I have to acknowledge, though, I know it can be long-winded at times. Um, all right, let's see. Hi, B. Let's see. Which blood test identifies mold exposure recently? What constitutes a high score? Can one get well from Lyme, Bartonella, Morgellons mold on Flagyl and Bactrim DS, Cipro, Cholesteramine, Rifampin, et cetera, previously one year in, one year in two? Okay, your thoughts. All right, so there's, I don't use a blood test to identify somebody that has mold toxicity. Um, but you may be talking about, so there is a test you can do um, of the blood called a C4A test, complement 4A. And it is a complement, the complement system, um, and there's a variety of things called complements. There's different kinds of complements. Is part of the immune system. It's a mechanism the immune system uses to fight infections. That's different than the antibody system, and that's different than white cells attacking something, okay? All right. And this type of complement called complement 4A, C4A, can become elevated if you have a chronic Lyme infection. It also can become elevated if you have um, uh, mold toxicity issues too, okay? It can be something sensitive for mold toxicity issues, all right? Now, Richie Shoemaker, who I mentioned earlier, also says that mold toxicity sets off a bunch of other inflammatory markers, something called TGF-beta-1, something called VEGF, for instance, and those can become elevated. The trouble is there may be many causes of those being elevated. But the thing about a C4A is there's only two causes of that being elevated. That's either Lyme or it's mold toxicity. So that could be something you could look at. The most accurate way, though, of knowing, in my, in my opinion, and the way that I've come to work more and more with this, is to see if you have mold toxicity illness is not blood testing is to get a lab from real-time labs and see, are you peeing out a lot of mold toxins? If you are, you've got a lot of mold toxins in your blood system then too, okay? So that's how I would go about doing that. Can you get well from Lyme, Bartonella, Morgellons, and mold? Absolutely. It may take time, but you can get better from it. Um, and so, yes, Flagyl, Bactrim, Cipro, Rifampin, et cetera, Yep, those are all antibiotics that treat Bartonella, Lyme, can help with Morgellons, cholesteramine can get your mold toxins out, um, but it may take time. You know, an average length of time to recover from just Lyme, Lyme without mold toxicity, Lyme without some of those, uh, uh, mostly without the mold toxicity and Morgellons, an average length of time is two years. And that means that um, it's an average. There's some people that get better in six months. There's some people that take three to four years, okay? Does it get more difficult to get there when you have all these things? Yeah, it does. But that doesn't mean you can't get there. And I've been able to take successfully people through this kind of a journey with that kind of a fingerprint of, of problems as well, too. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, B. Let's see. Hello, Joyce. Let's see. I've been having a lot of Herxy usually protocol of liposomal turmeric or quercetin, liposomal glutathione, don't seem to work well enough for me. I read about Nutramedics. Berber, what do you think about that for Herxing? So Nutramedics um, is a company that manufactures a bunch of herbs and for brain detox and for uh, mostly brain detox, they recommend something called Berber and Panella. I don't think they work. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that even what I've recommended doesn't work, but those I just find don't work at all. Um, so I, I, anyhow, I don't use them. If you are still having lots of herxing, you may want to back down on how aggressive you are about using your antibiotics. Sometimes if, if uh, using these things to modulate and alter 
the Herx reaction don't work, then sometimes we just got to cut back on how strong the antibiotic approach is. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Joyce. So for those um, that are wondering, what 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 do I recommend for Herx reactions? Reaction. Take a look at my chapter called Herxheimer and Cytokines. And you got a couple articles that you can look at here that kind of cover the same content, actually. Uh, one is this Control Cytokines, a Guide to Fix Lyme Symptoms in the Immune System. And the other one is Herxheimer Die-Off Reaction, Inflammation run -amok. Okay, I would take a look at those. here. Thank you for that question, by the way. All right. Actually, this is a follow-up question by B. Sorry, one year into treatment, how long? Getting very discouraged, especially with the skin sloughing off with Margellans. You know, B, if you're a year into this, it still could be about another year or two. Um, but I've seen people in about a year that, that aren't doing well, and then suddenly the whole light switch goes on and everything is better all of a sudden. I've had that happen before. Okay, so hang in there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear it has been uh, as difficult as it seems like it is here too. Okay. Hello, Michael. Let's see. Can I have Lyme with three negative tests? Yes. Uh, but 15, 20 percent of the time that somebody has Lyme, they won't have a positive test. So to see if you have Lyme, you've got to consider four things. Uh, one is, um, is there a risk of getting it? So if you happen to be somebody that's had a hunter with multiple deer ticks, bites, guess what? You're high risk, okay? If you live in New Jersey where 95% of ticks are shown to carry Lyme, you're high risk. Even if you don't do a lot of outdoor activities, you're high risk, all right? So we have to consider risk factors. You gotta look at, are there not a lot of symptoms that look like Lyme? Look at, are there any physical exam findings? And yes, you can have negative testing, okay? So I have, diagnosing Lyme is complex. You have to consider a lot of things. So you may want And I've actually got a half hour video article about how do you diagnose Lyme disease? And it's got PowerPoint slide and even I'm talking in it too, okay? Um, so take a look at this. It, it, it's very useful. It will help you look at do you have Lyme? Even if you have negative testing, I, I cover how to figure that out in this article. Okay. All right, let's see, what are your thoughts on stem cell therapy for people with post-Lyme disease syndrome? I think that's what you mean by PLDS. Um, you know, I, I'm still, I'm not quite clear if it's gonna make any difference. I think it's too early to tell. I know there are companies out there like Infusio that are making uh, great claims of benefit, but I've had a number of people that have gone through it and have not had benefit, all right? The other thing I will tell you, so what stem cell therapy is gonna do is it's gonna help um, improve immune function, supposedly but then it's still gonna be up to the immune system to turn around and uh, and either get Lyme out or the immune system turn around to correct the damage created by Lyme, all right? Now, the Lyme Disease Association has a, um, or LymeDisease.org has been collecting information from a program they have called My Lyme Data, uh, where people allow information um, to be collected about them and periodically they'll ask my Lyme data will ask for people to respond to some kind of a question that they have and then they'll publish the data, all right? So at the, um, Lorraine Johnson, who runs My Lyme data, um, at the um, ILADS meeting, the International Lyme Associated Society meeting in November in Boston this last year in 2017, uh, presented some information about what they're seeing in My Lyme data. And one of the things she presented, I'm gonna remember this number off the top of my head, but it was quite small is they, they, she went through and reviewed various treatments and, and whether the patients that are involved in Lyme, my Lyme data have seen benefit or not. 
And on the issue of, um, um, of the stem cell treatments, uh, it appears that people that have gone through it, only 10% are reporting improvements, okay? Just 10%. Now, granted, it's a limited group of people that, that are enrolled in this MyLime data, but that's the only uh, piece of information we have that is independent from these lab or these companies like Infusio that are getting great financial benefit from promoting this stuff. Um, the one thing I would say, if you are gonna do stem cell treatments, given how complex Lyme is, I'm doubtful that just one infusion is gonna be enough. I know Infusio is doing more than one, but you're gonna need more than one infusion, I think, to correct the problems. But again, the people that I have seen that have been through it, I'm not seeing that promising results for the majority of people. And then the labs, the uh, information uh, collected by my Lyme data would suggest that uh, it's not being that useful as well either. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. Let's see. Hi, hi, Katarina. Let's see. Does do all cases of Lyme have to be treated with antibiotics first before other supplements are added in? No, I, I think there's a lot you can do. You can do supplements first to get to balance the body, or you can do supplements and um, uh, your antibiotics together. You can go either way. All right. And what you may want to take a look at to figure out how I would do that. Take a look at my the the Lyme Rust protocol. I showed you that earlier tonight. It uh, describes how you can treat Lyme using a mix of supplements and prescriptions. All right? All right. Hello, Kay. Let's see. Good evening. I was, uh, good evening to you. I was recently diagnosed with Lyme after breaking out in a histamine rash at the end of October. Do you think this will resolve sooner or later in the healing process? Thanks. All right, so there's a condition um, that is gaining quite a bit of interest in the last year or two in the world of Lyme, which exists separate from the world of Lyme too, is something called mast cell activation syndrome. And so mast cells are a type of white blood cell that historically we thought were only involved in allergic reactions, but we now have good information that says that they actually get turned on to release their histamines by infection, all right? So it, what we thought is things that you're allergic to, like pollens and cat dander, would um, get attached to a type of antibody called an IgE antibody, and then those would land on mast cells, and the mast cells would release their histamines, and you would get your rash like you described, okay? Uh, but what newer studies are showing us is that chronic infections like Lyme, um, yeast, viruses, parasites, etc can trigger the mast cells to not only uh, produce uh, histamines and maybe more easily release them. We, we have studies that show Lyme will cause those histamines to uh, be more easily released in mast cells. Just having Lyme infection will do that, okay? But, um, but also these uh, mast cells are involved in being factories that produce all these inflammatory cytokines I was telling you about that give you most of your Lyme symptoms, okay? So the, the point I would raise here is that it might be that your Lyme um, or other infections are triggering your mast cells to make their histamines too much. That is something called mast cell activation syndrome. I've written a very extensive article about it, about some steps you can take to regulate that. Uh, the things I would point out, and I'll, I'll show you that article here in a minute so you can read it. Uh, there's diet changes you need to consider to be on low histamine foods. Uh, make sure you're treating all the right infections that can be stimulating those mast cells. And then you need to be on some things to stabilize the mast cells. And the two herbs that are useful at doing that, that I like using, is one is called quercetin. It stabilizes the mast cells so they're not producing as many cytokines and they're not producing as many of those histamines, okay? And that is a pill you would take as a 250 milligram pill and you wanna do two of those pills three times a day. The other thing you might want to look at is another bioflavonoid, uh, quercetin is a bioflavonoid. Uh, there's something else called luteolin, which is a bioflavonoid. These are chemicals that come from the skin of colorful fruits and vegetables. And uh, what luteolin is a strong mast cell stabilizer, probably even stronger than the quercetin. And it's 100 milligrams, and you would want to take that three times a day. 
Um, it's found, it's hard to find a clean source of that um, that isn't derived from the things that might also trigger allergies. The one product I have found um, that does that is a product called Neuroprotec. It's N-E-U-R-O-P-R-O-T-E-K, Neuroprotec. Um, and it has luteolin, a little bit of quercetin, a little bit of rutinin, but mainly luteolin, 100 milligrams per pill, okay? And I would, I would do that as well too. The other things you can do for those mast cells are to be on antihistamines um, and also a drug called Singular, okay? Let me do a, a quick um, screen share for you to show you what I'm talking about here. At, um, so it's the, it's the art, you can find it, if you're reading my articles, you can find it under my latest updates. It's this article called Mast Cell Activation Syndrome and Lyme. Just published that April 2nd. But take a look here, it describes the various steps you can take to help manage that, okay? All right, the other thing I wanna show you is, this is my supplement store, Marty Ross MD Supplements. And um, anyone can buy here. Um, if you're wondering when I talk about which curcumin to use or which glucosamine product do I think is the best, Take a look at what I have uh, placed in my store. I basically have curated supplements here that I think I have the greatest chance of helping you because the companies use a lot of good ingredients. And secondly, they're not using a lot of artificial um, uh, substances as fillers that may harm you, okay? All right, so I'm gonna just show you my luteolin product here. All right, so the product again, it's called uh, Neuroprotec. And uh, it's a good product. Uh, again, I think it's, uh, uh, it's very clean, uh, but it's a good source of the luteol. And this is the one that I was just talking about that you might want to take a look at. Okay, all right. Let's see. Hello, Katrina. Let's see. Is ART testing an accurate way of diagnosing Lyme? Um, so this is a form of kinesiology. It, it measures, um, it's called autonomic response testing. It's a variety of kinesiology. Um, it's kind of the same point I made earlier. It depends on who the tester is. If Dietrich Klinghardt, who is one of the founders and developer of this theory, is doing it, I think it's good. Um, there's a number of people he's trained out here. Amy Dirksen out here in Seattle area, I think, does it well. Um, but I do think there's another group of people that are just not doing it well. And I think there's a lot of people that are not doing it well, actually. So it all depends on who the quality of the tester is. Okay. All right. All right. All right, everybody. I know it's about five minutes early, but I am pooped. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it quits here for tonight. Uh, it's been a long day. I had a, a day of a lot of... Uh, complex patients that are, are interesting for me, but they always kind of just kind of wear me down a little bit as the day goes on and I've kind of hit my wall here. So I've got two Basinjis that are waiting for me to go walk them. Those are my dogs and I know I got to get to them and I just need to go home and take care of myself. So I'm gonna call it quits. Um, so tomorrow morning, look in your email uh, for the uh, recording of tonight's webinar, links to the recording. That'll come to you around 6 to 6.30 in the morning. Um, also in that webinar or in that email will be a link to sign up to next week's webinar. Okay, all right. Now in a second here, I'm going to take you back, direct you back over to my uh, Treat Lime website. Um, there you can subscribe so you can read all that great information. And also take a look at the, the new Lyme disease treatment protocol I put together. Really, I've come up with a more comprehensive uh, program that you could use to manage Lyme on your own if you're not able to get help with somebody else, or you could even use it uh, to help give some direction to your uh, healthcare provider, especially if you're seeing somebody that just knows how to do prescription antibiotics, but they're not doing the rest of the stuff to help you that I recommend. 
you can use my recommendations to kind of wrap around the care that they have, all right? So it's much more comprehensive, I think even a little bit easier to understand. Within the next day or two, there will be a printable version up. I know it's a little bit long right now. Um, and hopefully I'm gonna put together a table that just lays out what the various supplements are that you can use with that as well too. But take a look at that, okay? And I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the Treat Lime site. If you do subscribe, you get access to all those articles I've written and all the updates that I do regularly. But also you support these webinars as well too. Uh, great seeing everyone tonight. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, everyone. Good night.